Hi, this is Greg from Interview Insights. In today's video, I interview Lynn Kerr, a dedicated Senko from a high school in Northern Ireland. Now, Lynn's just recently won a prestigious national award for special needs education. So I'm delighted to be having Lynn uh, answering these questions with me today. Lynn, here's my first question for you. How do you develop a whole school culture and ethos where every child matters and can benefit from the support that they need? Well, Greg, I am really, really lucky to work in a school where it, it really is the most amazing school where all staff genuinely have the needs of all of the pupils at the centre of everything they do. And it is a real team effort. So in that respect, I have a lucky starting point. Um, my role as Senko is to really advocate for the kids with special needs um, and to bring special needs to the centre of everything in school, make it a whole school focus um, and just raise the profile. I couldn't do that on my own. It's too much of a massive job. So I have really good team behind me. I have a fabulous team of teaching assistants. Uh, I'm also a member of the senior leadership team. So being a senior teacher means that special needs is really at the centre of every decision that's made in school. And I've got the backing of the senior team as well. Uh, I have really good support from the Board of Governors, so they help me as well to drive change in school. Also, I would work closely with all of the heads of departments and all of the heads of year. So I would attend head of department meetings, head of year meetings, and that means that they can help me as well to disseminate anything, any strategies that I want to use, any interventions. They can roll it out to the rest of the staff, which is a massive, massive help to me. Also working closely with the head of pastoral care, who is amazing at what she does and is actually a really good friend of mine too. So we can work closely together. I introduced an SEN folder for all teachers. So they have their own SEN folder. It has a copy of the SEN register. So they're aware of all the people's needs. It has any training that we've done, has lots of resources. And I make a point of three or four times a year I physically go around each teacher, have a look at their folders, check that they know where it is, um, and you know, make it a real point of interest for them. I also chair a strategic group in school, which has a focus for SEN. So our senior teacher that's in charge of pedagogy has seven strands that she's focusing on, um, and one of them is SEN. So I chair the strategic focus group. And then that's a group of six other staff who share my passion and they help to share good practice. And then we have a shared staff area where we put anything that we find useful in the classroom and just share good practice with other staff. We are also a pivotal school, um, pivotal positive behaviour. We've had a lot of training in that. And the focus of that is that there's unconditional positive regard for all of our pupils and all of their needs. Um, and restorative practice would be a big part of that. So if something has gone wrong in a lesson with the pupil, then there's always a restorative between the pupil and the teacher. It could be a two minute conversation at the end of the lesson. And then the next day when they come in, they start afresh and the relationships rebuilt. That's really, really important. And as part of that in school, we only have three rules and they are be safe, be ready and be respectful. So the pupils have consistency right across the school. Also, I've done a lot of training on um, making sure that teachers know that every teacher is a teacher of SEN. It's just not all down to me and the team that are working with me. So it's developing their skills and giving them confidence in the classroom to meet the needs of the pupils with SEN. So that's an ongoing process. And every six weeks, we have a training session after school where the focus is SEN. So every six weeks they get refreshed training mm -hmm. and I will speak to staff before that, see where their training needs are, what they're needing help with and focus there. And then I have a SEN dashboard as well online where I would put up articles that I've read, journals that I've read and just anything SEN wise that I've came across just to, to keep all staff coming along with me on the journey. That sounds great. It sounds like you've got an awful lot on your plate, Lynn, and lots of things to organise and think about. But it sounds like you've got a fantastic network and very supportive yeah. staff around you to help you to do yeah, that so job. Yeah, I'm so lucky. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great. And it, it also helps that 
My principal was a Senko in his previous school as well. So him having an understanding because mm. nobody actually knows what you do. They see the free time on your timetable, which is not free. <laughs> There's mm. never a free mm. second. So to have him understand that and understand and help and give you advice is amazing as well. So I am lucky. And not all Senkos are in the senior leadership team. And I can imagine that would be terribly difficult for them to do the job yeah. as effectively as they would like to. Yeah. yeah, it is recommended that the Senko should be on the, the senior leadership team, but not all Senkos are. So I can imagine that that would make things things difficult. Mm -hmm. Great. I'll move on to our next question now, Lynn, if that's OK. Mm -hmm. well, in the UK, there's a gap of 18.3 percentage points between the employment rates of young people with and without disabilities from the age of 16 to 24. And my question to you is, how do you prepare students for life after school? Well, it's, it's all about setting them up for success and finding out what their strengths are and focusing on their strengths. You ask any people what their strengths are and they find it very very difficult to tell you even us as adults it's just mm. something we're really uncomfortable with uh, so working with the people identifying their strengths and focusing on those and seeing how that can link into what they're going to do when they leave school because ultimately as a teacher that's what our job is is to prepare young people for life after school um Obviously, pupils with SEN will struggle with academic attainment. Um, so it's focusing on developing skills such as their interpersonal skills. We would run all of our pupils do an OCN GCSE qualification in vocational skills that's implemented by the careers department. So part of it is they will research careers and jobs that they're interested in. They will match their skills and qualities to jobs they're suitable to. The part of it also is teaching them how to actually apply for jobs and how to fill out application forms and what is important interview-wise, interview, interview -wise, you know, how to go for an interview, how to focus on their strengths. Um, we also have, when we, our pupils come to GCSE, there's three different pathways for them. So in terms of what subjects they can pick in each of the three different pathways at the end of year 12 should achieve at least 10 or 11 GCSEs. So pathway two would tend to be our more academic pathway. Then pathway one would be a mixture of vocational and academic subjects. Then uh, we this year, just in year 11, we've introduced a supported pathway which is a completely tailored curriculum that would be for, we have a supported class that would come through school from year eight of pupils who would be have high SEN needs, but would still be mainstream. So that curriculum is really tailored to their needs. And they would, this year, for instance, they're, they're focusing on essential skills English. They would do, we've introduced subjects that are of interest to them. For example, they're doing horticulture, hospitality, nails and beauty. Um, and then they've got their OCNs and vocational skills, RE, Princess Trust, which they get two Bs at GCSE for. And it's been really, really successful for them so far. We also would do a week work experience for all of our pupils um, and the pupils with SEN. We would put in place things for them to really help them find work experience, we'll support them in securing the work experience. And then when they're out on work experience, myself or the classroom assistants will go out and visit them just on their work experience. And, you know, it, it, it's really heartwarming to see them out there in the world of work, in their area of strength and their area of interest. And really at the end of the day, it's inspiring confidence in the pupils to go on and, and achieve and not let their barriers come between them and what they want to be. Um, and just making sure that they're happy and comfortable with who they are when they leave school. That sounds wonderful. It sounds like you've got lots of great things in place to help to develop those life skills. So that really does sound like you're doing lots of great things there, Lynn. How do you implement a more personalised and relevant approach to the curriculum for identified learners based on their individual needs? Well, the, the main thing, as I mentioned before, from the teacher folders is that every teacher has a copy 
a hard copy of the SEN register so that when the pupils arrive with them, they know exactly what their needs are. Mm -hmm. The main thing is IEPs, the individual education plans are key, uh, absolutely key. I've seen IEPs that have been written in the past that are just generic and aren't individual to every single pupil, but I ensure that every single pupil who needs an IEP in school has had an input into it. So I would have a meeting with them and their parents and their form tutor or year head, just whoever's involved. But it's re that pupil voice is so important and young people actually really would surprise you in their ability to sit down and they can actually tell you what they feel their targets should be. They're very, very good at when you ask them what what can teachers do in the class to help you? They're very good at telling you. Mm -hmm. um, and then just to have that on a written IEP for the teachers to do really, really helps the pupil. And that pupil voice is important because they feel they're being listened to. Sometimes you'll ask pupils, what are the teachers doing in class? You know, sometimes the pupil will say the teacher's not doing anything to support me with my dyslexia or whatever. But it's getting the pupils to realize that there's a lot of invisible support put in there that teachers are actually doing for them. And then when they realize that, uh, it can be a positive step forward. Uh, again, focusing on the pupils' strengths with their learning. So I have a box on their IEP that really mentions the pupils' strengths. And it's really important for teachers to match the learning to the pupils' strengths and to their areas of interest. So for example, I have a couple of pupils at the minute who have a real, real passion for history for World War II. And if it's an extended writing piece in English is try and match that to their area of interest. Um, I have another wee one, he just loves cars, anything to do with cars. And the minute you can link their learning to that is when you'll open the door um, to them be able to break down the barriers in the classroom. They've also got to see a reason of why they're learning things. So those conversations between pupils and teachers are so important as well about why they're learning certain things and um, the reason for their learning. Reviewing the IEP regularly with the pupil and matching the targets to the areas of what they're struggling with. Um, and again, I've said about the pathway that we've introduced at year 11 is introducing new subjects, subjects that are more relevant to them. So the horticulture, travel and tourism, public services is really popular one at the minute with our pupils. Uh, carpentry, beauty, hair and beauty and nails. Um, so all just matching learning to their strengths and their interests. What are the most effective ways to carry out assessments for pupils with SEN to assess their needs and to monitor their progress? So sometimes there would be a bit of debate in school about if our supported classes should do the same tracking tests as the rest of the pupils. Uh, but in one way, you're trying to see where they are in line with their peers, but you're also looking to give them success. So it's finding a balance between that. Uh, really, we would do when our pupils come in in year eight, I would meet with all of the Senkos and the primary school te P7 teachers to get a background on where the pupils at and um, get their CAT and their PI and their PIM scores, which are standardized tests from primary school. And then that way we can look to identify who we need to put support in for straight away. Uh, so there is early identification there and there be early intervention in terms of identifying needs of learners with SEN that's something that I've made a real focus for staff training is to try and empower all of our teachers to identify pupils with SEN so we would follow the code of practice where if a teacher has concerns they will complete a record of concern about the pupil and they'll maybe discuss it with me or the head of year or the head of department then they'll do a stage one action plan where they will put strategies in place for that pupil They'll, they'll set a review date and hopefully the strategy, the extra strategies they've put in place will have helped the people in the class. If it hasn't and they're still not achieving, then that's where a discussion with me has. And then there's a discussion about whether the pupil gets placed on the SEN register at stage two and gets an IEP. Um, it also, I've done a lot of training with staff of what 
SEM provision actually is and how it's different to whole school provision. So it's just getting everyone to remember that the definition of SEN is a pupil that has greater difficulty than their peers with their learning. Um, and keeping that in mind when you are doing assessments. The SEN register is a working document and in an ideal world, you would, through a process of assessment, looking at their standardized scores, their tracking scores, any pastoral care interventions, that all pupils would move off the SEN register, but it's just about scaffolding the support for them and then weaning that support away for them to make them more independent. That sounds great. Thank you very much, Lynn. Now, you successfully applied to the local authority and you've helped to launch a specialist autism unit. And I was just wondering if you could tell me some more about that project. So our autism specific class, we were approached by the education authority um, to agree to trial the, S or the ASC in our school. It is, uh, we've got one teacher and two full-time classroom assistants for a maximum of eight pupils. Now, these pupils are pupils that just would not cope fully in mainstream education. So it is an alternative SEM provision attached to our school. It's fully integrated in main, mainstream. So these pupils, they completely belong to our school. They all wear our uniform. Our teacher is absolutely fantastic. I've been so, so lucky with the teacher that I've employed, she, she's amazing. Um, at the minute, it's a key stage three provision. So we have four pupils in year nine and we've got five in year eight. Um, and then once they move through to year 10, then the plan will be if they move on to a key stage four provision or the aim would be to put in enough scaffolded support for them then to move out into mainstream. Uh, ideally, the plan as well would be to for us to take more provisions in school because there is such a high need. We just don't have the space. We would have 10 of them if we, if we could. We would do a lot of reverse integration as well. So the pupils in the provision, whenever they come into school, everything is individually tailored for them. They have access to the full curriculum. So they it's the same schemes of work it's just totally differentiated to their needs uh, some of the pupils are able to integrate in some mainstream classes with classroom assistant support um, but some of them just aren't ready yet so it's individual as I keep saying for each uh, each pupil part of the reverse integration as well is some of our mainstream pupils would go across to the provision and work alongside the pupils work alongside the teacher which is brilliant as well and we would some of our older pupils with autism as well would go over and help to mentor and uh, the younger ones that are part of the provision and some some of their curriculum could be literally teaching them life skills like I know Margareta has taught them how to boil a kettle. Some of them didn't know how to boil a kettle, make toast, make scones. Um, she takes them across to Tesco's and they, they had a coffee morning for the parents where they went out and bought the ingredients and they priced the ingredients that how to make the scones went up to HE. But it has been really, really successful. And our whole school has embraced um, the provision and the pupils that are part of the provision. So it has been so, so successful, but it is, it is heartbreaking because there are so many pupils that need provisions like this, but there is no, not nowhere for them to go. Um, and I actually would have several pupils in mainstream that really should be availing of a provision like that, um, but there just isn't space. So. That's great. Well, it sounds like a really nice thing where you've got a small group. So they've got some more independence, as you say, to go out into the community, to go to the supermarket, get the things they need, which they might not have the chance to do if they're in a mainstream class. And I also like that idea of the reverse integration. I've seen that working really effectively in school as well. So it sounds like a really good project that you've got going there. How important is it to build relationships with parents? And what are your approaches to build meaningful and strong relationships? It's a real team effort 
between myself, the pupil and the parent and the external agencies. And I would start developing that relationship when the pupils are coming into us in year eight. So I would meet with the parents before they start in August, before the pupils start in August, get that relationship developed, talk to the parents, because at the end of the day, they know their child best. So it's important to listen to the parents' view to make sure that they feel that they have a voice and that they feel heard and get advice from them as well, you know, about what works, you know, such and such is really struggling with this, you know, have you any advice of what we could do in school? Um, I would do this for meeting with parents quite often, like always meeting with parents, email communication on the phone, just being available to parents. And if they've maybe sent me an email or they've phoned and I don't have the time to get back to them, I'll just acknowledge it and let them know, look, you know, it's a bit of a busy week, but I will get back to you on that. Keeping them updated with any referrals that have been made or pointing them in the direction of where they can get support themselves, just being a support for them. Also, I try to introduce like for our autism provision, the coffee morning where all the parents came in and met together and they formed a relationship as well and a support network there too. Um, bringing parents up to school, showing them what we're doing with the pupils, involving them in the IEP process, having training evenings where, you know, one week it could be bringing up the parents of pupils with autism and doing some training with them because quite often they they maybe don't have an awareness of what a diagnosis actually means and empowering them to help support their child at home too um, and but really the relationship with parents is really really key and it can be something as a senko that can be a bit of a struggle because in school you are the gatekeeper to getting their child's support and it can be very hard to get and even though you've spent hours upon hours maybe filling out referral forms and maybe for to get a child a statement and then if it's turned down they can take it's easy for them to to take their frustration out on you but it's just letting them know that you are there for their support and you are trying your best and you know you will have those difficult conversations on their behalf um, when you need to. So that does sound really important to involve and to share practice with the parents as much as possible. And are there occasions where parents are not quite as cooperative as you would like? And how would you tackle that situation? Um, it would, oh, there would be, but it's it's developing trust, you know, and getting them to trust me and trust staff in school and letting them know that you're on their side and letting them know that you do you understand and you understand the needs of their of their child um but no it was something that i do have really positive relationships with parents that's great thank you lynn um on to my next question now and what do you consider to be the biggest barriers to peoples with sen their confidence, confidence in themselves. You know, they've came through primary school with their barriers, feeling like they feel they haven't achieved much success. So it's just building up their confidence. Uh, I also feel a challenge for them is a lack of knowledge of if they have a diagnosis. So working with them to understand if they have ADHD, well, what does ADHD actually mean? Why are they taking medication for ADHD? Um, what does autism mean? Why they, they struggle with certain things and helping them with strategies that they can overcome and trying to work with them. I always try to get them to see their their barriers as superpowers, that they just their brain just works differently and getting them to realize that. Some of them may also have parents with SEN needs themselves that maybe can't provide them with the support they need at home. So it's trying to fill that gap too. Um, working with them and working with home. Also a big barrier would be access to the curriculum. So working with staff to differentiate their lessons just so that they, they can actually access the curriculum in the classroom. Um, and again, work giving them 
wee buddies in school, maybe some senior pupils who have similar diagnosis, sitting down, talking to the pupil and making them feel that, you know, they're not different, that they we all have our strengths, we all have our challenges and, you know, we're all working together to help them. Fantastic. That's a great answer. Thank you, Lynn. And my next question is, so what would you consider to be your greatest challenges and how do you overcome them? I flip a could be here all day talking about that. Um, basically, the volume of an impossible workload. The workload of a Senko is, any Senko will tell you, it's just unachievable. Um, but it's just staying positive. And as I say, I'm so lucky with the team I have around me. Um, I just feel like I have about 200 tabs open in my head every day, just trying to, to keep everything. Um, also... A challenge would be I have all this knowledge in my head and I want all staff to, to have this knowledge. You know, I know all the people's needs. I've got their files all in my head. So it's finding a way of sharing that knowledge and keeping it at the forefront. Um, it's hard for it when a teacher has 30 pupils in the class to remember the needs of of every child. So it's it's working with them and finding ways that we can share that that information and developing um, their skills to in the classroom to meet the needs of the learners with SEN. So te teaching, helping teachers with their quality first teaching. And I've actually done myself and the teacher in charge of pedagogy did a training session on the actual difference between whole school provision and SEN provision. So a lot of teachers will think that SEN is just for the Senko and everything is for the Senko but my role in school is to coordinate the provision it's not to do everything for everyone so it's empowering teachers to do that and we've came a long way in our school and we're all on the same page with that otherwise it can be a very lonely job being a Senko you can feel like you are on your own um, doing everything but as I say I am lucky the biggest challenge probably is you can feel like a failure all the time because you just feel like you can't fix things. You're trying so hard to fix the barriers for the kids and fix things and it's an impossible task. You need a, a team effort to get there. Um, and if something isn't working or you've given a strategy to a teacher and it doesn't work, you question yourself and you feel oh my word, have I not supported that teacher enough or have I not supported that pupil enough? Am I not supporting that parent enough? So it is easy to feel to feel like you haven't done enough. Um, and that that's probably the biggest challenge. Um, and another challenge is, as I've said, you as a second core, the gateway to trying to get the pupil's support, but you're so limited in, in what you can get. And if a pupil needs a diagnosis you know it's it's getting access to the external agencies that can give that diagnosis and it it is frustrating and it's just the procedures for it all you know it sounds like you have many challenges lynn but it sounds also like you're doing everything in your power to overcome them and it also sounds like you're doing a wonderful job as well so um I'm going to move on to our next question now. So what have you just what have you found to be the most influential or inspirational reading material that's helped you to do your job more effectively? Um, well, I said at the start, so I staff would know me as SEN geek. So I think you can never stop learning um, with regards anything you do in teaching, but it's continually reading and you just have to keep the passion and reading around materials. So I would be a member of a few Facebook forums, which are fantastic, um, a lot of resources, and people are so keen to share any reading material, journal articles. So anything I come across, I would put in a wee folder and then I share it with staff, either by email or on our WSEN dashboard. Um, I, I, really good book that we've all read as a staff which has completely changed the ethos in our school so I'd said at the start that we are a pivotal positive behaviour school is when adults change everything changes by mm. Paul Dix so we have all read that as staff 
and it's been absolutely fantastic. I actually took it with me on holiday with my friends. So where they were all, they were all sitting reading. I think it was at the time where Fifty Shades of Grey was out. So all my friends were sitting reading it, and there I'm on the beach reading. When adults change, everything changes. So, um, it's wonderful. Uh, another one I've got. Um, I went on a, a training course a couple of years ago with some American psychologists, and one of the best books is the art of kid whispering reaching the inside kid absolutely brilliant just teaches you to get inside a kid's brain and just how to reach those children who are so disaffected because so many children with SEN become so disaffected with their education and it, it was absolutely brilliant I've read it a few times it's by Mark Fredo and then another brilliant book is Reclaiming Youth at Risk by Larry Brentrow. I met Larry Brentrow, he's an American psychologist, a few years ago on a training course that I went on with some youth workers and he was so, so inspirational. And if I, I could have him train every member of staff in school, he was, he was just wonderful. So Reclaiming Youth at Risk, brilliant, absolutely brilliant. So they would be three of my top books and um, then I also am in the middle of completing a master's in education with SEM. So there's a lot of, done a lot of reading with it and research articles. So I find whenever I'm maybe researching journal articles for an assignment, I get like lost in a big black hole of reading around one journal article leads to another. But I just think you can never stop learning mm. um, and just keep reading as much as you can. And there's so much out there for to share. Great. Thanks for sharing those resources with us, Lynn. That's great. And those are all my questions now, but if you've got anything else that you would like to share for this video, then please go ahead and do so now. Well, actually, this morning I was doing a wee bit of reading and I said I love to share things, but I came across a really nice wee quote that just for any teachers who are watching this and I thought I'd share it. So said teachers help students find important things they've lost every day sometimes it's a paper a backpack or a jacket other times it is courage confidence and a smile and I just really really like that we quote so just remember we're all doing an amazing job and as I say you can feel like such a failure all the time and for every one thing you get right you get 10 things wrong but just focus on everything you're getting right uh, especially at the minute things are so so tough in schools with COVID um, and everybody is just absolutely run ragged but the young people are being phenomenal uh, and there's days whenever I won my award I actually felt that it's the pupils who deserve it because they literally do inspire me every day and if you never be afraid to ask your senko for advice that's what we're here for it is our passion you don't do the role of senko for the money for being on the senior leadership team you just you wouldn't last in it so we all do it it is our passion and just ask us for help and advice anything you're doing right share it with us so we can share it with with everyone else um, and just thank you all for everything you're doing with our young people you're all amazing that's great. And um, some important points you finished on there. Thank you, Lynn. And I think you must you're doing an amazing job by the sounds of things. So I'm sure your your team and your pupils appreciate everything that you're doing for them. And um, so that's the end of our, our interview. I've really enjoyed asking you these questions today, Lynn. So thank you so much for taking the time to answer these questions today. And thank you. I hope you enjoy the rest of your weekend. Thank you. <laughs>